Let's, before we come around the word, can we just pray? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, your name is so great. Your name is so holy. Your name is so pure and righteous. Lord, you call us to be as you are, holy and pure and righteous. And the only way we can do that is in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word, Father, your precious, inerrant, unfailing word. And I pray that, Father, as we look at it today, that you will take this weak, imperfect vessel and speak through it, Jesus. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's really carrying on from the message last week. Remember last time I spoke on foundations. Foundations, the rock or the sand. The sifting or shifting sand, I think I call the message. This really is a continuation um, and a finishing part to that Uh, message. I'm going to read the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among You envying and strife and divisions, are you not yet carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? For then, for who then is Paul, sorry, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we are labourers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For another foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Other, sorry, than what is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. 
For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Excuse me, Wally. My mouth is so dry today. I hope you forgive me sitting down a couple of times during worship. It was not meant to be, uh, be offensive or uh, you know, just so weak today. So please forgive me in that. Okay. As I look around the body of Christ, now in general I'm talking now, as I look at the body of Christ, the church today, around us in the day that we live at the so-called evangelical press at church websites of which there are many and I think ours is pretty good but there are many it's it comes it's come clear to me that just what the apostle Paul faced when he had to write these these letters to the church in Corinth. The converts there, in the main, as we saw in the series that we did here on the Corinthian church, any of you remember that? It's on the website, so if you, if you want to listen to it, we went through Corinthians there, at least Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, anyway. But when we looked at that, we saw that the converts that came out of that society were in the main from a heavily hedonistic, paganistic society. Do you remember that? Worshipping idols, worshipping demons, blood sacrifice and, and so on and so forth. And in, my, in the series that we looked at I went into a lot of detail as to just what that society was like, so I won't go into that again today. If you want to learn more about that, have a look at the messages, listen to the messages. But really, the days in Corinth are a lot like the days today, aren't they? Everyone does what is right in their own mind. The order that God set, man and woman in marriage, no longer survives, does it? in any sense of the word. And so much is going on from the world in so much of the church. So in that sense, the church, the majority, the bulk of the body of Christ, what calls itself the body of Christ today, is very much like this young, troubled church in Corinth. And we'll go more into that as I go through the message. But they were in the main from a paganised, hedonistic society. And their heads and their, their lives were full of these paganistic rituals and lust and unrighteousness, basically. And so Paul has to write to them to correct some things. This was a new church. This was a newly planted church in Corinth. And it was in transition, if you like, from this pagan, wicked, unclean world, this unclean society, into the kingdom of God. And that can be difficult, can't it? It can be difficult. And there were problems. And Paul had to write to them firmly but in love to correct 
some things that were going on there that were not bringing glory to God. They were not honouring to his name and were bringing disrespect and negative views of that society on the church. Because in some cases what was going on in those churches was as bad, if not worse, than what was going on in the society. Read through Corinthians yourself and you'll see this is true. And so here they are, this, this young church that had been planted by the apostle, struggling in this transition and struggling with many things. And Paul is writing to them, just as he has to do in many other churches to correct error, to lead them back onto the straight path. And you know, this is why in Corinth, just as in every other church that was planted by the apostles, as I've said, and indeed by anyone ever since, any church planting that has ever happened, that is a, has desired to be a godly church, that would follow the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, would have to stick to the foundations that had been laid. We saw that last week. Some of you were here, some were not. But we looked at those foundations. The rock is Christ Jesus. The rock is the inerrant, infallible, timeless, powerful word of God and the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Amen? That is our rock. But you know, a foundation is good. Foundation is great. And if you have a strong and a firm, solid foundation, you have something wonderful. Any of you who've had a new home built, well, joy to see the foundations being poured. A foundation is vital, isn't it? And it's important, but it's only one part of the house. It's an important part, but it's only one part. I've already spoken briefly on the foundations last time, but we're going to look a little further on this subject of building today. And I want to look now at first at the foundations to go over some things. It was, I hope, clear from my last message that the core of the foundation of the Christian faith is the rock. Does anybody not know that name? If so, see me afterwards. No, I don't mean that. Yes, I do, actually. But the rock is Christ Jesus. We are planted on Christ and we are planted in Christ. Is that right? He is our rock. He is our foundation stone. And we, as living stones, are built together with him and on him. And also the word. He is the living word. The living word of God. And his faith in Christ and his finished work at Calvary, that is the very bedrock of our Christian faith, isn't it? And it's what we all stand on. But that's good. We've got a foundation, but we need a house. We need a building. We need to be knit together in some way. And it's the, the knowledge that we are wretched sinners. We're saved by the grace of God through faith in his finished work of Calvary. His death is atoning death. His propitiation for us is death his burial and his resurrection this is the good news isn't it that is the foundation and that's the gospel isn't it that's the good news praise god is everybody clear on our foundation good however this is only brought about after our acceptance and entrance into the kingdom of God. This only brings us to the place of being 
made a part of God's family, doesn't it? Repentance, conviction of sin first, repentance and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ only brings us in the gate. It only brings us through the gate into the kingdom. But you know what so many people miss, so many people in the body of Christ miss, is that there is not only, as we can see in Matthew 7, a narrow or straight gate, which few find, but there is also a narrow and a straight way. A narrow and a straight path after that gate. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 say this, just as a reminder. Enter you in, words of Jesus, enter you in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there are which go in thereat. I think you'll agree that there are many who have gone through that white gate. And it leads to destruction. In error and condemnation. But because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. See that? Narrow is the gate. But also narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Find what? The narrow way. It's a narrow gate that we come in. We come in naked. Naked. Having nothing of ourselves. We throw, we cast all that off when we come to Christ and lay ourselves at his feet and submit to his lordship, don't we? So we come in there naked. But you know the way is also narrow. The way is also straight. And it's that way for a reason. Because God is holy. Jesus is holy. He's righteous. He's pure. He's just. And if we are to be like him, if we are to be in him, we have to follow the way that he himself has set. Is that true? He is our pattern, isn't he? And so he has brought us through that narrow gate and now we follow him looking unto him who died for us, who is waiting there as our king and our priest at the end of the race, at the end of the marathon. But the way between the gate and to that is the narrow way. It's a lifelong journey, brothers and sisters. If you came to Christ thinking, well, I'm saved, I've done it, that's it, I've got my ticket to heaven, I don't need to do anything else, I'm sorry, you're in for a shock. Because coming in is just the beginning of the journey. Once we come in, we submit to Christ to follow his way. And we do it his way. Yes, you're through the narrow gate, narrow gate. But there's also the narrow way to follow. As I've said, it's a journey and it's to transform us from what was to what shall be. This path is to transform us from babes who have come from the flesh into the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Scripture tells us this and we'll look at that in a moment. But it's to take us from babes to adults in Christ. That's what this path is for. And that's why Paul and the other apostles were so careful to address everything that may distract from that path. To keep people, to keep the body of Christ straight and true. To be honouring to the Lord whom we serve. In other words, as Paul wrote so well in Ephesians 4.13, 
till we all come in the unity of the faith. And I want you to listen to this verse because so often half the verse is missed. So often I've heard until we come to the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Yes, it says that. But I want to read you the whole verse. It says, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now that is something different. There's a lot of things in that verse that you need to understand. I haven't got time to go into it today, but you need to read these verses, saints. Study them. This is not a game. This is life or death. We've chosen life in Christ. And to go along this path is to follow this principle. To come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Do you know him? Unto a perfect man. He is the perfect man. And that is what this path is leading us to. That's the purpose of this path. Is to bring us into the knowledge of the Son of God and to that perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Not to be a little bit like him. But to be totally like him. To be so given over from what we were that the old man no longer exists. All that remains is Christ and Christ alone. That's what Paul was trying to build. That's what Paul was trying to protect and to bring the church at Corinth and other churches that he pastored to. These were, if you like, Parts of a framework that God has set. Foundation is good. Have you ever seen a house being built? A good illustration are American houses. I don't say that because our family lives in America. But most of their houses, the great majority of their houses, are made of wood. And the foundation's laid. And first of all, there's a wooden framework goes up. You've seen barn raisings, haven't you, on movies where they raise a barn all together? There's a village or something. Well, you know, God is building, Jesus is building a house. Jesus is building his church, his temple, and we are the living stones. But, you know, he set a pattern in Scripture for us to follow so that that building is square, it's level, it's plumb. Why is that important? Because it needs to be built according to the heavenly pattern. Just like the one that Moses was instructed to build. Until we come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What a verse that is. And how briefly sometimes we pass over these verses. More on that a little later. We've seen the foundation. Now we recognise there's a structure to be had. A structure to be followed. And this is what Paul was addressing. He'd already laid a foundation of Christ, hadn't he? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was in their hearts and the foundation had been laid and the framework was having to be pointed out to them. Read 1 Corinthians 3 again in your own time. 
to see more about that. But let's look at this structure. Once a foundation's laid, there's then a structure to be built. And of course, as with any building, there are architects' plans to follow, aren't there? Anybody still there? There's architects' plans to be followed, aren't there? And there are building regulations to follow. And anybody that's built a house or had a house built knows that full well, the problems that that can cause if you don't follow them. But the architect's plan must be followed and building regulations adhered to so that it's acceptable and legal. Is that right? So it is with the body of Christ. Our plan, our pattern is Christ. If we only knew it. Our pattern is Christ. Our foundation is Christ and our pattern is Christ. How's that for simplicity? But how about that for power? Our plan and our pattern is Christ and the building regulations are the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. They're the building regulations. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Do you remember the law that Christ fulfilled? That's now written on your heart. That now is your new disposition. Your new character, your new makeup, because it's Christ's disposition in you. It's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He's the head, we are the body, and both have to synchronize. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? The head and the body need to be synchronized. They have to work as one. Otherwise, you've got the body running off in one direction and the head falling and rolling on the floor in the other. Now, that might sound like a joke, but that's what's happening to the, a vast amount of the body of Christ in this day. The head and the body are not in synchronization. Why? Because they're not sticking to the plan of God. They're not adhering to the pattern of Christ and his word. And this is what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians 3 and in other places too, but we're looking at that today. The body must obey the head. Is everybody in agreement with that? The body has to be in obedience to the head. Hence Paul's letter to the church at Corinth here. The architect's plan, God's set order, was not being followed. It was not being adhered to. There is then a structure, a framework that God has ordained to be in each church, each part of the body of Christ. This place is part of the body of Christ, isn't it? But within this church, there is a structure to follow. Just as in the greater body of Christ, there is a structure. And it's a microcosm of that greater structure that is to be followed. A framework that God has ordained in every part of the body of Christ. This structure in the church is a reflection of the heavenly pattern. And when I say the heavenly pattern, I mean just that. God the Father over all, Jesus the Son Jesus Christ, the Son, the God-man. Aren't you glad that Jesus is God-man? 100% God and 100% man. Not 50-50, it doesn't work that way. He is 100% God and he's 100% man. Try and figure that one out. But that's what he is. And Christ was subject to the Father and yet co-equal with him. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says this. 
speaking of Jesus. Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Well, you think, Jesus is God. You mean to tell me he had to learn obedience? Yes, as a man. He had to submit to his father, yet being co-equal with him. Jesus spent much time in the fields or in the mountains in prayer, seeking wisdom and direction from his heavenly father. Jesus submitted himself to the Father. And then you have the Holy Spirit who was sent by Jesus to convict the world of sin and judgment and righteousness. John 15 verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send to you from the Father... Even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So there you have a pattern. Perfect submission, yet perfect unity in the Godhead. That, brothers and sisters, is the pattern or a type of the pattern that God has set in the body of Christ. And we're going to look at that More in a moment. Now in the church, or the body of Christ, does does everybody understand when I say the church, I mean the body, not the building. I think we're past that, don't we? We all know that the church is the body. Praise God. We are just that. We are the body. The body, not the head. Jesus is the head. That's a given, isn't it? Jesus is the head. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, says this, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So there you have a structure. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We may not like it, but that is the word of God. Let me read it again. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Ephesians 4 verse 15 says this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ. And finally, Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. That doesn't mean the bully. Doesn't mean the the governor. It means there is a role division. There is a separation of roles within that marriage. There is the husband and there is the wife. And God has ordained it so. And for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Can you say amen to that? You see, us husbands are to love and respect and to cover our wives as Christ loves and covers and protects his church. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? And there is to be mutual respect of those roles in Christ. Now in this body of Christ, with Christ as the head, Christ has set a sub-order. And when I use that word, I use it in the right sense. It's not a business. It's not a something run like an office or a factory, but there is a sub-order, a sub-framework in the body of Christ that God has set for reasons of protection, for guidance, and for teaching. 
And that is found, as Paul so wonderfully writes in Ephesians 4. Let's write, read that together. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 32. Ephesians 4. You all know this, I hope. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave, who's that he? Jesus. And he, we could say Jesus there. And Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come, there we have this verse again, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I won't go right the way through to verse 32 for time, but you can see there that God has set an order, hasn't he? God has set a framework in the body for its protection, for its good, for its teaching, for its nurture, and for its benefit. That it may be built up on that framework and be fit and honouring to God. Do we all agree on that? It's plain from these verses that this order, if you like, this structure of ministers was given in the body and for the body for the purpose of teaching, correcting, encouraging and nurturing the body of Christ. Yes? We've already said about this church in Corinth where they were, many of them were in a transition from the world, from a pagan world, in sin and wickedness, into the kingdom of God now. Being grown, if you like, being nurtured, transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so God has set this order. The Lord has set this order. Now, it's for all those reasons, for nurturing, teaching, correcting, encouraging, and so on. Not from their own wisdom. I want to make this really clear. This structure is not to overwhelm, overpower, to browbeat the body of Christ. This framework has also a responsibility and answers to God. We'll see that in a moment. But it's not to be this teaching, this correcting, this education, this, this nurturing is to be, if you like, as channels of the word of God to the people of God. To teach about what this framework is. Teach about what the building is. Teach what it's to be like. Teach what Christ expects of his church. It's not to be from earthly or worldly wisdom, not from our own thoughts, not from our own desires, but from the inerrant word of God here. Blessed by the Spirit of God through prayer and supplication and study of the word. That is the role of leaders. That is the role of this framework. It's a responsibility. And it's not to be taken lightly. And believe me, it isn't. But it's not to be from our own thoughts, wisdom, desires, but from the inerrant word of God and by the Holy Spirit. For which, let me add, as leaders, we will answer doubly to God. And if you don't believe me, turn with me to James 3, verse 1. James knew a lot about leadership. He was leader of the church in Jerusalem. And so he knew the work, the pressure, the responsibilities of leadership. And this is what James says in his epistle. James 3, verse 1. 
My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Or the words there are greater judgment, correction, testing before the judge of all judges. Because as a framework, we are responsible for what's built around. Are we not? If the framework fails, the whole thing falls down. And so the framework, this order that God has set, is set there for a reason. And this is something else that Paul was addressing. Remember we're saying that to in the text that we read in 1 Corinthians 3, some are saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. I'm of this, I'm of that. Paul had to correct them. In love, but he had to correct them. We, in our day, only really see visually in the body of Christ a shepherd or a pastor. Some call them bishops, but it's the same word. Or elders and possibly deacons, depending on the size of the body depending on the size of the congregation. However, these are still part, no matter how big, no matter how small, these ordained ministers, ordained ministries, are still part of the God-given order. They are still part of the framework that God set out in Ephesians through Paul in Ephesians 4 verse 11. And they come under the heading pastors and teachers. There are many other giftings. But in those areas of responsibility within the body of Christ today, mainly we see leaders, whether it be a pastor, whether it be an elder, or a deacon, are part of this God-given order and are under God's scrutiny daily, hourly. And will answer, in the end, for what was produced around them. So it's important, isn't it? This matters of leaders... It's covered again for us in, I won't go there now because of time. But 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 talk about elders and deacons, how they are to be chosen, how they are to act, how they are to be treated and respected. Remember, it's a God-ordained role. Whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, it's a God-ordained position. And God himself will judge. There's also, of course, through scripture, especially from Jesus himself. Matthew 18, instructions and directions, pattern for correcting error, correcting sin, how it is to be addressed and how it is to be done, whereby it honours God and the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, saints of God, these teachings and these instructions are as valid today as they were when Paul spoke them to Corinth, when other apostles wrote them in letters to their fellowships, fellowships that they themselves had founded and were responsible for. Paul instructed others, he instructed Timothy to ordain elders, remember? Who were like-minded studied the word of God and were filled with the Holy Spirit to teach the people, to follow on. Because we, this might come as some surprise, but we will not live forever. I, 
in this body and not eternal. I will pass. But God's word and God's order does not. And regardless of what happens to me or any other pastor or any other elder, the body of Christ still has its responsibility to follow that narrow path, to follow the pattern of Christ. Amen? So what does this all mean? Paul found it necessary to remind those in the church in Corinth that there was and must be order and discipline in the body of Christ. Order and discipline in the body of Christ. God is not a God of chaos. God is a God of order and perfection. Look at nature all around you. Look at your own body, how it works in unity, one with another, one member with another. God is a God of order. And so there must be and be maintained order and discipline in the body of Christ in order for it to function well and also bring glory to God. Isn't that why we're all here? This is what this narrow path is for, saints. It's to perfect us, to change us from what we once were to what we can be and what we shall be in Christ. There is indeed a framework which is fit and right for the church, the body of Christ, to be built upon the rock of which we looked at last time. That rock is Christ. That rock is the finished work of Calvary and the precious word of God. But once in, there is a path to follow, a framework to be built around and accepted and respected. When once we become committed to a local body, a church, it's essential for us to accept and respect the order that God has set in it unless there is heresy, unless there is sin. Okay? For which that leadership will have to answer anyway, but they must repent of that. But that aside, the order and the discipline according to God's word must be followed in order for the building to be right. This means submitting to the leadership and that's part of our training, our lifelong training along this narrow path that leads to Christ. If there are questions, if there are problems, if there are difficulties in the local body, they should be brought to the leaders who are to pray and seek wisdom and discernment from the word and from God in prayer. And their decision is final because that decision will ultimately be answered for to God. And the leadership, if they are right with God and if they are in obedience to God, know that. But the body also needs to know that. Unless they're in sin, their decision should be obeyed. Otherwise, there is chaos. Otherwise, we end up with what we see in Revelation. We touched on that last week, and I won't go there again. The church at Laodicea. What does Laodicea mean? Laodicea means people's opinions. People's decisions. Do you remember what it says in Scripture, in Judges? Every man did what was right in his own mind, in his own eyes. That's not the way God builds his church. We follow his way, his pattern, and the house is built right. Failure to follow God's pattern led to the rebuke of Laodicea. They felt they were okay. 
They felt they were doing things great. They didn't need anybody. They didn't need anything. They had everything. They were comfortable. They were satisfied. But God told them, you are wretched. You have nothing. Because they didn't follow the pattern. And my wish and my hope is that no one here wants to end up like Laodicea. God bless you all.